All right. On today's podcast, we have Lanhe Chen. Lanhe is currently a candidate for controller of the state of California, which is one of the many impressive feats for him. Uh, after earning four degrees from Harvard, including a law degree and doctorate in political science, he served in senior roles in both Republican and Democratic presidential administrations. He is regarded as one of America's leading policy commentators and experts specifically on healthcare, which we will be diving into today. Uh, he teaches at Stanford. He was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve as a member of the Independent and Bipartisan Social Security Advisory Board. Uh, he's built his own small business, focusing on providing advice on fiscal and other pub public policy issues to leaders in both the public and private sectors. He is an investor, works with entrepreneurs to help them grow their businesses and create new jobs. And he is currently the chair of the board of directors of, of El Camino Health, a healthcare system in his community, born and raised in SoCal. He's a son of immigrants from Taiwan and grew up rooting for the Dodgers and Lakers, which he remains a diehard fan today. Uh, I, I think that's uh, about all of it. How are you doing, Lonnie? Did I miss anything? No, no, you got it, Jeff. Great to great to be with you. Yeah, I appreciate you taking time off of the campaign to to come on here. So, uh, first things first, what does the controller of California do, and why are you re why are you running to become the next controller? Yeah, it's a great question because it's not an office that people tend to spend a lot of time thinking about. But uh, California has uh, eight statewide elected officials who uh, each have individual mandates. So you talk about the governor and the lieutenant governor and the attorney general. Those are probably the, the most well-known. The controller is responsible, broadly speaking, for all of the money the state spends. So think of the controller as the chief financial officer, the chief fiscal officer, um, the individual who is supposed to provide accountability for every dollar the state spends. Uh, and the controller has the ability also to audit any program uh, or any uh, spending of state resources and can also audit local agencies that, send, that spend state dollars. So th there's this really interesting kind of oversight watchdog role that the controller has as well. The last thing that a lot of people don't recognize about the controller is uh, the, the controller actually sits on 80 different boards and commissions statewide in California, including both of the big state pension boards, CalPERS, which is the public employees fund, and CalSTRS, which is the teachers fund, pension fund. Uh, and interestingly enough, kind of some stray cats and dogs like the California Coastal Commission, uh, which, which oversees uh, the development or the, the preservation of California's coastline. Uh, but only in even numbered years, oddly enough. So the, the controller is, uh, is a really kind of powerful fiscal uh, platform. And, you know, in terms of getting into why I decided to run, I, I've, I'm a native Californian, as you um, noted in your introduction, I grew up in the LA area. I've always had great affection for my state. Uh, I really love this place. But I think that there is a lot about it that needs to be fixed. And I think there are a lot of things that, frankly, drive me crazy that seem like basic blocking and tackling errors. If, if one wants to use a football analogy, given that we're recording this during football season, um, the, the, the state could be executing so much better on the basics. And it starts for me with the fiscal issues and how the state is spending its money. And are we really doing everything we can to serve the taxpayers of the state in the way that they deserve to be served. And so for me, it's, it's really about getting in there to fix problems. It's about seeing opportunity for our state to be doing so much better. And I, I just think it's a great fit given my background, which is primarily in fiscal policy and fiscal issues, but also more recently in fiscal oversight activities in the private sector uh, that, that I think bring a good background to the office at a time when our state desperately needs it. We have a lot of different challenges. And um, I'll just conclude by saying that I think many of them are rooted in our inability and our failure to get the uh, 
um, the fiscal elements of what we're doing right. Right. So you have spent a lot of your career in federal policy relating to, you know, specifically fiscal policy. And, you know, it's, it's no shock to the listeners of this podcast uh, or anyone who's followed your work that it's very, very difficult to reform Social Security and Medicare at the, the federal level. So is this more of a I can have a, a tangible impact here and actually make a real difference at the state level? Or is it, you know, just an allegiance to the state of California having grown up there? I mean, I'm from Ohio. I feel the same allegiance from that to the state of Ohio. Or, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of all those things. I mean, I, you know, as I, as I noted, I, I do care deeply about California. I do think that there are a number of things, you know, having worked in federal policy for for a while uh, and looking at the current political makeup of, of Washington, there, there seems to be an intractability to policy conversations at the federal level that, I'm not saying they're absent at the state level, but I think that they're in many ways at the state level, policymaking can be a lot more impactful in people's everyday lives. And that's something I've come to discover with time is just this recognition that what the state does and the state's powers and abilities to impact people's lives are so tremendous on any number of different issues, Jeff. I mean, I don't care if it's healthcare or taxation or economic policy. You talk about here in California, we have a homelessness crisis. We have a cost of living crisis. We have a a tremendous number of issues relating these days to public safety in many of our bigger cities here in California. And these are all issues that fundamentally state government needs to tackle and address. Yes, local government as well, but, but state government plays a very important role. So for me, I, I, I do think there's this combination of caring deeply about the state, but also maybe coming around to the recognition that there's so much we can do at the state level that we aren't doing now. And I'd like to contribute to that conversation and that discussion. And I think serving in this role is a great opportunity to do that. Now, let's talk about two specific uh, pieces of, of policy before we get into the, the mechanics of the job. When you talk about a tangible impact. So there is this story that's been going around for a while that uh, unemployment insurance in the state of California um, saw fraud up to $30 billion. So I, I'm not entirely sure what that means. I've been following it very closely. It sounds like you know, so $30 billion of uh, the unemployment insurance from California was just stolen um, from, from fraudulent claims or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then the second one would be, uh, you know, you're talking about how Medi-Cal, uh, California's Medicaid program, and this is on your site, it's just one example of, of uh, you know, the number of people that have enrolled in just the last uh, seven years has increased 50%, which is not fraud by any means, but it, it's just an example of kind of like the, the bloated budget in the state of California. So those two pieces of, you know, you have uh, these, these tangible examples of fraud, and then you have these obviously ballooning costs for different programs, specifically in California, that those seem like the the right and left hand right here of, of what you're doing with the job. So if you want to jump into specifics, I'd, I'd love to know kind of like how you would approach both of those, those items. Yeah, well, the, those are two really substantial problems. So let, let me start with um, the unemployment insurance issue. And then and then we can talk a little bit more about Medi-Cal and what's happening here with healthcare. Um, on unemployment insurance, what happened was essentially when the pandemic first arrived, uh, obviously the state of California went into a pretty um, severe lockdown. And as a result, a number of businesses had to shutter, particularly small businesses, and a number of people lost their jobs and weren't able to work. And, and even those who, who did have jobs found that they were in a very different uh, economic condition and situation. I mean, the, the entire country faced a, a deep recession because of how quickly things changed due to COVID. And so, as you might expect, a number of Californians applied for unemployment insurance benefits. Um, you know, we're talking now March, April of 2020. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the challenge was given how many applications for unemployment insurance were coming into the state, um, the, the state quickly got overwhelmed. Its systems weren't prepared and didn't have the capacity to handle 
all of the incoming. And so there started to be a backlog for those unemployment insurance benefits because the process generally takes time. There has to be verification. There has to be um, you know, research done in some cases to determine and verify eligibility for benefits because you're talking about a program that at various points in time, not just in California, but elsewhere across the country has been abused and has been um, taken advantage of by scammers and fraudsters. So when the system became overwhelmed and the number of people waiting in line grew, the state of California, particularly Governor Gavin Newsom and a woman named Julie Sue, who ran his uh, employment development department, which is the department that oversees this program, made a decision to open the floodgates and simply let everybody who applied for benefits get them. And the predictable result of that was, of course, you had millions upon millions of claims coming in, all of which were being paid without so much as a, uh, a quick computer verification that the person even was a real person or that it wasn't some criminal enterprise that was trying to um, apply for and secure benefits so that it could facilitate criminal activity. So a, a few months later, it became clear the state had a problem. And so the state then in the fall of 2020 abruptly shut off benefits and went back again to verification systems that were taking a very long time, which resulted in a backlog that until actually earlier this year was well over a million applicants. So the, the system is a complete debacle, but as the research begins to be done on what happened during that period of time when benefits were basically allowed to go out the door without verification, the initial audits come back and reveal that the amount of fraud perpetrated against the taxpayers of the state of California through this program was well in excess of tens of billions of dollars. And in fact, the state auditor, who is separate from the controller, the state auditor who is appointed by the governor and can do audits when the legislature requests those audits of her, she actually audited the program and found that in fact, the amount of fraud was up to $31 billion with a B. That up to $31 billion of fraud had been perpetrated against the people of the state of California. And by the way, some of that fraud was perpetrated by criminal enterprises outside the United States, including Russian uh, uh, criminal activity, criminal activity from the People's Republic of China. Uh, you had fraudsters, individual fraudsters here in, even in California, in the United States who were applying for benefits. Um, I, I mean, it was so ridiculous, Jeff, because you had at one point dozens upon dozens of applications going to people in state prison, including uh, convicted murderer, Scott Peterson. You had benefits being paid to someone posing as Senator Dianne Feinstein. We know now because prosecutions have begun, uh, federal prosecutions in the Central District of California and the Northern District of California have showed that you had individual fraudsters taking hard-earned taxpayer dollars and spending them on new homes. Uh, in one case, a $71,000 Audi and uh, you know a lot of other stuff that, that frankly makes your blood boil. And to put a fine point on it, all of this fraud was preventable. Jeff, it was all preventable because what the auditor revealed in her report earlier this year was that the computer systems, as well as the infrastructure supporting the unemployment insurance system in California, should have been upgraded 10 years ago, at least. Because it turns out we had a similar issue of fraud, nowhere near as large as this one, but a similar issue with fraud during the Great Recession of 2008-2009. And at the time, the auditor, the same state auditor had issued a report saying, hey, state of California, you need to fix this problem. Otherwise, it's going to result in a massive fraud. And of course, the state didn't fix it. And so what do we have? Ten years later, we have massive fraud. Um, and that's the kind of frustration for me, at least, that, that just says, look, this is an eminently fixable problem. And $30 billion is not chump change. I mean, $30 billion is a significant percentage of the general fund budget in California. It could have been used to pay teachers and firefighters and public safety officials. It could have been uh, used to help struggling families during the pandemic 
It could have been used to address the water challenges we have in the state. It could have been addressed to battle wildfire, to engage in wildfire prevention, which is expensive but necessary given how drought prone our state is. So I, I just, um, this kind of stuff drives me absolutely mad. And someone's got to fix the problem and someone's got to take some accountability for it. And no one in Sacramento does it. They just keep business as usual. You know, let's just keep doing what we're doing, working fine, but we know it's not. So th that's the unemployment insurance program. I don't know if you want to ask any questions about that, Jeff, before I get to Medi-Cal, but it, it, it's, to me, it's just a tremendous example of where a state as innovative, as vibrant, as dynamic as California has fallen so deeply behind and it's so broken. We just need to fix it. We need to shake things up. And the business as usual is not going to work out here. Now, now quickly, I know you kind of, you said it's a, a significant part of the general fund. So put that in perspective. I mean, yeah. How big is the, the state budget of California? Like how much is $30 billion that could have been used elsewhere? 31. Yeah. So, so uh, to, to give you an, a, a, a concept of kind of what the, what the state budget is, the, the, the state general fund budget is usually about a hundred and let's call it $140 billion or so. Okay. Now the general fund is, but a, a component, a small component of the overall spending the state does, because we also have federal money that comes in. We also have specialized funds, for example, that go to certain education elements. We also have a, a variety of other kind of special things. But if, if you think about the general fund at roughly 140 billion ish, I mean, give or give or take, I mean, it's 133 ish in 2021. And then there have been some projections to revise it up, but let's just call it about $140 billion. $140 billion, you're talking about $30 billion in fraud, right? You can quickly do the math and figure out that's, you know, a, a little less than a quarter of, of, of your state budget is being wasted on fraud for a single program. Jeff, it's That's not insane. even like a, a, a government-wide audit. We're talking about a single program now. So, I mean, this is, <laughs> as you can imagine, it's very frustrating to me to, to hear people say that things in California are going just fine. They're not. You have almost a quarter of your budget tied up in fraud in a single program. Let's not even talk about the other programs where we know there are things that can be fixed and, and efficiencies that can be gained. And, you know, to my progressive friends who want to, you know, spend more to solve these problems, I would say, listen, the, the controller's job is not necessarily to say where you should be spending the money. The controller's job is to make sure the money that you spend is being spent well. And I would think that everybody, whether they're conservative or progressive or otherwise, they want the state to spend smarter. And that's really what my campaign and what this platform is all about. I want to be able to in, in empower the citizens of the state through their elected representatives to make smart decisions about how we spend our money, where we spend it, and the outcomes we get. Well, I, I do think that the thing that also is just so frustrating is there. there's this lack of, of a sense of a of, of the fact that these, you know, these people are fiduciaries of their constituents and it doesn't get them angry that they basically, they basically got gamed, right? It's, it's more so the uh, managing the optics of what happened. Let's bury the story. Let's make sure people don't find out about it. That being said, it sounds like there is an audit that's, that's going on. So what's, what is, what, what's your confidence level of how much money would actually be brought back into the system or, penalties that are that are doled out <clears throat> to excuse me to uh, prevent this from happening again yeah unfortunately I don't know that the state's going to get a lot of that money back um, you know I think prosecutors will do their best to recapture what they can but I think Jeff the vast majority of that money is lost I, I, I mean I just don't I think the question is how do we prevent this from happening again and how do we make sure we find out exactly what happened? And to the extent that we know who, who's responsible for it in terms of perpetrating the fraud, we prosecute them accordingly. And, and I've said, I hope the Department of Justice, both in California and at the federal level, throw the, throw the book at people who, who frankly have abused 
uh, the public trust in this way. And, and by the way, those in government who fell down on the job, they should be held to account as well. Um, you, you know, I know that um, monopoly is one of the themes of, of your podcast. And I'll say this, that the challenge we have in California is we have had a one party monopoly in Sacramento. We have had a, and, and, you know, by the way, I think in other states, when you have single party rule as well, it's not good. Single party rule anywhere is not good, whether it's Republican or Democrat. But in California, the problem is particularly acute. And it has been Democrats who've been in charge. The Republicans have not won a single statewide office in 15 years. And the problem you have in government when everybody is wearing the same jersey is they're all looking out for each other. They're not looking out for taxpayers. They're not looking out for the people of the state. They're busier preserving their own political careers, figuring out who's going to advance next, who's going to hop into the, the, the next statewide seat so they can be a gubernatorial candidate in 10 years. That's what they care about. They don't care about solving problems and helping people. And this is what happens predictably. This is what happens. Well, I think competition, you know, we're both free market guys, you know, competition is really what breeds quality in any sector, in any uh, part of society. Right. And so exactly what you're saying, you know, whether it's a all red state or all blue state, you want somebody who's offering a, a compelling alternative is thinking about something differently um, just at the very least. So the people in power have to, you know, do a little QA on their, on their own ideas and, and be held accountable. Um, and I think exactly what you're, I mean, how, how, how in the world does a, uh, you know, a, a program of that scale just get even, even, uh, you know, verified to start to say, okay, we're just going to let people sign up with, with no verification. Uh, you, you would think that there would be some, someone basically ringing the alarm bell saying, Hey, this probably isn't going to work out well. Um, uh, but I think yeah. it's a lack of competition that, that really, uh, is what happens. But it, it, so, so the audit powers, right? So, um, obviously, you know, not very confident the money's going to get clawed back, but, you know, the, the controller, that's something that, that you talk about, the, the, the boards, and we'll get to Medi-Cal, by the way, but the boards the controller sits on and the audit power, uh, that's interesting. So the audit power, I, I have no conception here of what that includes. Are you, you know, are you, are you sending people to, uh, to, you know, go, go past go, go straight to jail, forget the $200, or is this more of a, you know, we're just, we're, this is like, there's, there's already a system in place to hold people accountable. Um, like, what does it look like if, if you have the reins on the audit power and actually are able to uh, hold, hold the people in power accountable for the, the taxpayer's money? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about systematically going through and saying, where are our really high risk um programs, where are really high risk challenges in the state where we know that there's an opportunity either for mismanagement or or for outright fraud. You, you know, in some cases, it's not malicious. It's just people, there aren't good processes in effect to make sure that the system and the program is being managed well. So it's it's about having a systematic approach to going agency by agency, program by program and saying, can we examine how the money has been spent? Can we, you know, I, I firmly believe that sunlight is the best disinfectant here. And so we need to do everything we can to make public whatever we do. All right. I am, I'm not going to get an audit. And if the audit says something embarrassing, well, we'll bury it because I'm trying to protect this person's political reputation. I really don't care. I mean, I, I, I think my job is to do everything I can to help the people of this state understand exactly what state government is doing. I'm not beholden to anybody. I don't owe anybody anything from my political career. I'm just out there to furnish the information. And that is the powerful element of this office. And that's the platform that, you know, I depart from is really, how can I use this office in a way to help people understand exactly what their state government is doing so they can demand change? So they can demand that their legislators and their governor do differently. The controller doesn't have the ability independently to pass new policy, doesn't have the ability to change necessarily how the state spends its money, but working with people and, and, and truly in a grassroots way, helping people understand this is what's going on. I do think we can, we can bring change and I think we can bring change where it's, where it's desperately needed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's super interesting. I mean, I, I, 
coming into this conversation, very little knowledge of, of the controller uh, in, in California of any state really, uh, but it's obviously very important. Um, so let, let's talk about the other side of the coin here. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably end up talking a lot about healthcare here. And so this is a good bridge to walk over. Um, let's talk about Medi-Cal, why that's so important. And also, you know, the, the rising healthcare costs that I know are, are a contributing factor to some of the fiscal challenges in the state of California. Well, yeah. So Medi-Cal is a, is the state, California state Medicaid system. So let's just back up for a second. Medicaid as separate from Medicare. Medicaid is the joint federal and state program that was originally started to help single moms and there, and, and has grown over time to include you know, poor single moms was the original target audience and it's grown over time and states have kind of added to it. And the massive expansion of Medicaid happened with the passage of the affordable care act in 2010. And the ACA made any American who makes less than 138% of federal poverty, uh, able to, to qualify for the Medicaid program. So whether you were, um, you know, disabled or not male or female, you know, basically everybody who made under a certain income threshold would now qualify for Medicaid. And so, you know, the, the result was, was quite dramatic. You had, um, states that, uh, expanded their Medicaid programs consistent with the affordable care act. Uh, actually originally the affordable care act mandated that states, um, expand their Medicaid programs. Then the Supreme Court stepped in in 2012 in a case called NFIB against Sebelius and concluded that this that, that requiring states to do that was was a unconstitutional exercise of federal power, and so states were then given the option to uh, to expand. And California did expand. Many states did expand. Some states in the South, like Texas and Florida, chose not to expand. Um, so as a result, in California, the percentage of people on Medicaid increased dramatically, and the program itself experienced you know, pretty significant growth. Uh, and even though the program has grown a lot and it's serving a lot more people, the efforts to ensure program integrity, as well as the, um, you know, are we making sure that the money's actually getting to beneficiaries versus going somewhere else? that process has not been as aggressive as I think anybody who cares about the state would like to see. We need to be in an ideal world, ensuring that we are auditing this program on a yearly basis. Let's make sure that people who are eligible for the funding are the ones who are actually getting it. Let's make sure the benefits being delivered are consistent with the benefits being promised. All of these elements of the program should be working as well as they can for beneficiaries because that is what the state's commitment is. But more importantly, for the taxpayers who are paying for this program, we need to ensure that our tax dollars are being spent in the way that we're being told they are as opposed to on something else. And unfortunately, Medicaid is one of, is one of those programs where in the past there has been fraud. There's been documented fraud. People who are not actually eligible to claim those benefits, claim them. People oftentimes will, uh, th there's fraud, by the way, both on the side of the beneficiary, but also the provider. There's also Medicaid provider fraud as well, where, you know, bad doctors, bad providers try and get more reimbursement from the state for services they didn't actually perform. And so on both sides of the coin, we need to make sure that the state has made a policy decision about who should get Medicaid. I don't take a position on that as controller. What I do take a position on is let's make sure that the people who the state legislature and governor intended to benefit are actually benefiting as opposed to somebody else. Now, you said that the goal would be to audit at least once a year. How, how often are these uh, claims in the entire program being audited now? Yeah, well, we haven't had a comprehensive system-wide audit of Medicaid. I think it's in three years. I think the last one was done in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, the problem with that is when you have the program growing, and particularly during the pandemic, as people 
uh, faced economic challenges, they likely became Medicaid eligible. And so the program expanded further during, during the economic shutdowns following the start of the COVID pandemic. This is a time when we want to be particularly sensitive to what's going on and make sure that the program is functioning as, as, it, as we intended it to. So I, I think we need, we need a yearly audit and in some cases, maybe even more regular touch points to make sure that we have a good handle on exactly what's going on. And by the way, technology helps enable some of this too, Jeff. It's not like we have to have somebody go there and like physically go through paper documents. We have such tremendous technology that's able to look at patterns and detect fraud much more easily. We have pretty sophisticated, I mean, you think about the private sector enterprises that have to detect fraud in the financial services industry, they have the ability and the tools to go through and figure these things out pretty quickly um, without a lot of manpower and a lot of time. And we should be employing those technologies and, and those efforts at the state level as well. And one of the things I do as controller is let's get the counsel of people who do this every, who do fraud prevention every single day and figure out how we make sure that we are employing tactics that allow us to say one step ahead of potential fraudsters or those who would look to rip off taxpayers in the state. So use technology to forward deploy instead of waiting for it to happen. Um, it's like, uh, you know, if you, if you go somewhere that you're, you usually don't go, you get a, uh, you know, a, te a text message or buy something you usually don't buy, you get a te text message from Chase, you know, was this right. year who made that right. purchase? Right. That would be nice right. to have for, uh, <laughs> keeping uh, taxpayer dollars uh, where they're supposed to be. Um, so, so the other part is rising healthcare costs. So what, well, let's just back up, you know, the drivers of rising healthcare costs. I mean, are they the same in California as they are everywhere? Because this is, you know, something that I think uh, there, there's just, there are a lot of drivers, right? This is not a, a monocausal, um, you know, problem, but there, so it's, there's kind of a lot for everyone to, to cherry pick from. So uh, you, you are the healthcare expert here. Where would you start in terms, take, maybe taking off the controller hat now, you know, where would you start in addressing what the, the, the major drivers of, of rising healthcare costs are? Yeah, boy, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Jeff, that there are a, a ton of different causes for this. Some of it is innovation driven. Some of it is consumption driven. What I come back to is, I think we have a fundamental challenge in our healthcare system, which is that the end consumers of healthcare are not actually the, the lion's share of those who pay for, for healthcare, right? We have a third-party payment system, by and large, for, for most Americans. Uh, most Americans are in uh, employer-based or job-based coverage. We also have a substantial number who, who are on government coverage via Medicare and Medicaid, but let's put that aside for a moment. The majority of Americans still get their coverage through, through, through their jobs. And in those plans, the ultimate cost of healthcare is still very much shielded from the end consumer of that healthcare. So I'll, 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 let's just use a, an example to illustrate what I mean by that. If you go and you buy you know, pretty much anything, a computer, an appliance, uh, you know, clothes, whatever, you, you don't necessarily know how much it costs to make that item, but you do know how much you are actually paying for it. You know how much you have to charge on your credit card or pay cash for people who, for the 1% of people who still use actual currency cash, um, you know, you know how much you are paying for an item and you can go online and you can go to Amazon or you can go somewhere else and you can price compare between different places and you can even compare different models of the same item. So let's say you're buying a cell phone, you can compare the iPhone 13 to the Samsung Galaxy, whatever they're on now. And you can look at bet, you can look at the, the products and what they promise to do and how much they're charging. And you as the consumer can make a fairly well-educated and reasoned decision. You can also maybe go to a third-party website to tell you a little bit about what those items are and what's good and bad about them. So you, you have this transparency. And as a result, you know, again, to return to this concept of markets, you have a better functioning market because you have relatively good information. The information asymmetries exist, but they're more limited. 
And you know, for, you know, for better or for worse, you kind of know what you're getting into when you show up at the store or when you click online to buy something. Uh, healthcare is dramatically different. If you get a particular procedure performed, I mean, let's just talk about, um, you know, an example of, of, of a, you know, like some kind of procedure you get like a, like a hip or knee replacement as an example of a procedure. You don't actually know what the cost of that is. You know what your financial burden is based on your insurance plan. So you know, for example, because of my insurance, I'm paying this much money for it. And you can even have a pretty good sense ahead of time, if you want to, what you're going to pay for it. But you don't actually know how much the doctor gets paid. You don't actually know how much the procedure costs. How much does it actually cost at one facility versus another? You don't necessarily know. You know what your insurance component is. But a lot of the actual cost of healthcare is hidden to the end consumer. So you're only paying for a fraction of that care. And as a result, what's happened over time is in the aggregate, consumption rises because we don't actually know how much it costs. And so things appear relatively cheaper is the wrong word, but the cost to us is relatively opaque. And so as a result, we don't necessarily have built-in constraints to limit how much healthcare we consume, or in the alternative, the provider doesn't have an incentive necessarily to limit consumption either. The provider has an incentive in some cases to increase consumption because in some programs like Medicare, providers are paid by volume rather than outcome. So you have on both sides of the equation, both the provider as well as the consumer have incentives to increase consumption with relative opacity around how much that consumption costs. And as a result, the system as a whole becomes ever more expensive. People are consuming more goods. It's not like there's a competitive marketplace to drive prices down, right? Because again, how do you compare between one doctor and another or one hospital and another? You sort of, you know, you just go to what's convenient or what's near you and you sort of do it. And because your personal uh, outlay is relatively insensitive to where you go, you just kind of say, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do what's convenient and I'll buy more healthcare. And as a result, then the cost of healthcare escalates because there is no constraint on, on spending, on outlay, or a dynamic that would help drive prices down. So fundamentally, I think the reason why healthcare gets ever more expensive is because we have this third party payer system in the US, which is not changing. I'm not proposing it'll change anytime soon. I'm just saying the way the program is structured, we, we're not going to be in a place to know how much things actually cost. And as a result, those prices are going to increase and, and the cost of healthcare goes up. And, and, and yeah, of course, there are things that drive that up as well, like As I noted earlier, if you have innovative new technologies, those technologies are going to be expensive when they first come on the market. Uh, If you have relatively uncompetitive provider markets, so in some parts of the country, you might only have one OBGYN in a 50-mile radius, that lack of competition also tends to drive up cost as well. So there there are competitive issues, there are system issues, there are innovation issues, um, you know, some argue that the profit incentive in healthcare is too present and that drives up cost. There's all sorts of different arguments about this, but for me, I really do trace it back to the opacity of, of the, of the cost structure in healthcare. So, yeah, it's, it's just such a big, it's such a, it's such a large, uh, you know, bear to wrap your arms around with so many moving pieces. Um, and I do want to talk about the tying of, health insurance to employment and the history of that. Cause I, I did you know, do a lot of prep on that. Cause that's uh, something I find really interesting, but to your point around the, the transparency piece, you know, my, I, I guess my follow-up question is, okay, that makes tons of sense. You know, the, the fact that there is a lack of competition due to the fact uh, that people cannot see um, they cannot compare across services and, and, and the, the price um, and the quality and all that stuff. There's not a, a, a clearly defined transparent market. Um, that's basically saying, okay, you know, we, we know why the car is going slow. It's, you know, something in the engine 
is not working right. And, you know, in this case, it's the fact that people cannot, uh, you know, see across uh, prices, across services, and therefore um, there's a lack of competition and therefore the quality is, is lower or in fact, you know, the, the prices are going up. So in this analogy, what is it within, within the, the price transparency problem, what, what is inside this engine that is, that is wrong, right? So um, outside of just, you know, the raw competitive piece, uh, which is, which is, you know, pretty easy to conceptualize. Are there any specifics if you were to drill down on this part of the problem that you would want to, you know, highlight, like, what is it really about, or, or, you know, a fair answer is there are no specifics. It's just, this is just the, the invisible hand you, you make the, you, you take away the invisible hand piece of it and prices are going to go up and, and quality might go down. So it, it, maybe that's the answer, but are there, are there any specifics within this price transparency piece that you would point to that uh, you think are the, the leading drivers here? Yeah. I, I mean, look, I think there's a few things. First of all, the um, there is no central repository for prices, right? And I'm not arguing that there should be because that wouldn't necessarily solve it. Where we are, where we are seeing some headway being made here, by the way, is some employers, some private sector folks, are beginning to make more information known to their employees and to their um, you know people who are subscribing to their plans what the price differences are. And in some cases, by the way, you have some employers that are actively helping their employee bases shift to higher quality, lower cost environments. Um, there, there are things, for example, called centers of excellence that some companies have created, which is basically to say, look, we are going to have our health care for this particular procedure. We're going to encourage people to go to this institution and we're going to create the economic incentives to do that because we know this institution delivers quality outcomes at low cost. So there are things underway, but generally speaking, the, the role the federal and state governments can take is to encourage and provide incentives for greater transparency in pricing. Now, the federal government tried, has tried this a little bit in terms of mandating, for example, that hospitals provide transparency around the pricing of their procedures, as well as disclosing the deals they're striking with insurance companies on certain procedures as well. Uh, I think to a point and to a degree, that kind of transparency is beneficial and helpful. We have to be a little bit careful that you still allow the market to work in the sense that what oftentimes creates pressure is this competition between different providers and different insurers. And that negotiation can also help drive down costs. So you don't want to create a disincentive for that. What I would say, though, is generally speaking, what governments can do is to encourage greater transparency around the pricing of procedures, as well as fundamentally helping the consumer better understand what are they getting for their money. Those are things government certainly can do and should consider doing at all levels, and not just with respect to hospital pricing, but you know, physician pricing, procedural pricing, making sure there's transparency around all the charges that come forward, et cetera. Um, it, it, isn't there? Yeah, I was going to say, isn't Go there ahead. a lot of uh, isn't there a lot of noncompliance around the the hospital pricing? The hospital transparency, transparency? yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that there's been a lot of noncompliance because some of these institutions believe it's not in their financial interest to do so. And so I think we have to make a decision. Do we fundamentally believe that what's being asked of these providers is fair? Is it fair for us to ask them to reveal procedural pricing? I think so. Is it fair to ask us to reveal all of their negotiations with various insurers so there's complete transparency in that regard? That I'm, you know, a little less certain of in the sense that you still want, again, I mean, the question is, if you were to publish all that, would it actually make it more likely you'd have lower prices? Would everybody go to the lowest price? Or would you have certain insurers basically saying, we're not going to work with this hospital anymore, effectively creating a monopoly at that hospital, right? So you have to think kind of second and third order in terms of whether we want that kind of dramatic transparency around those negotiated prices as well. But the fundamental issue, for example, of asking hospitals to reveal 
hey, what's your price guide, right? You go to McDonald's, you know how much the chicken McNuggets cost. You go to Best Buy, you know how much the you know, TV monitor costs. You go to a hospital, you, you probably ought to know how much the procedures cost. Now, that may not be a very meaningful number. That's the problem, Jeff, is that if someone says, okay, here's a procedure and it costs X dollars, that's not meaningful to you necessarily because you've got insurance and it doesn't matter how much that charge is because that's not what they're going to charge you anyway. Right. So the, the transparency here is about more than just, hey, reveal all your prices. It's give us prices in a way that helps us as consumers make decisions and helps us understand what we need to do. That is my point is can we, um, you know, can we make sure that people have the information and can consume it and then act on it? That is really the key. So what's interesting is uh, path dependence, because all of these you know systems I, I feel like have been cobbled together, and now we're in a place where reform is completely uh, dependent on um, what has come before it. So path dependence here, and you know the the really interesting piece to me is the history behind um, you know in the the late uh, 1920s you had the uh, you had Blue Cross, which was a bunch of hospitals in Texas band together uh, so people could, um, you know, buy the first insurance plan, basically. Um, and then doctors uh, basically, you know, said, we don't like that in California. And they created Blue Shield, obviously Blue Cross, Blue Shield. They merged eventually in the, the, the 80s. Um, but that was the first kind of the first form of insurance. And then in 1942, you know, because of World War II and uh, effects of the Depression, you know, you had President Roosevelt, basically, you know, he, he, he has, he, he establishes the Office of Economic Stabilization um, with an executive order, and they froze wages and then businesses, uh, you know, adapted as they do, and start offering health insurance um, tied to the job in order to, to supplement the, the uh, loss of increased wages, so or the ability to increase wages. And so now we have this system, uh, where people get their health insurance through their employer. Now, I happen to think that that's actually, uh, you know, not a good thing. I, I do think that if you just start from first principles, that's probably not what you would do, right? Because it it, it increases the cost of of switching your job, um, and it's obviously got all of these downstream effects that we've we've touched on today. Um, and then the other part is the the first principles of when you're describing all this stuff, a transparent market. What it makes me think of is that we would need to. Or I'm sorry, that the, the ideal solution would be a private marketplace where consumers can just log on like an Amazon and just compare prices uh, across all of these different services. They can get reviews of doctors. And obviously there are things like ZocDoc that, that are out there that, that try to do this. But so many startups in the healthcare space just end up you know, selling into the system that, that already is. So I guess to, to kind of wrap up here, you know, we already touched a lot on, on California, but, you know, I think a good way to, to end this is, you know, how, how does this, this path dependence in healthcare affect the solutions that could have been, or, you know, to look at this a different way, maybe the, the people trying to solve these problems should just think about a way to do it starting from first principles, right? So Uber was not, uh, if, yeah. they, if they would have thought about path dependence, they would have thought, okay, well, we're going to sell software to the taxi industry. No, that, that's not what they did. They just, yeah. they willed their way into a better solution that was 10 times better. So how, how do you think about this um, to, to bring us home here? Well, yeah, this is a tough one, Jeff, because if we could start over, we would, but we can't, so we won't. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, the healthcare system is entrenched. It is you know, path dependence is entirely the right way to think about it. Because when I give talks on this, I just point to the fact that if the IRS had not made the revenue ruling, it did the one you spoke about, which essentially was a way to circumvent wage controls after World War II. If, if they had not done that, we would be in a very different place. And by the way, if we had a smaller society, right? Singapore is a society of a few million people. They're able to essentially re-engineer their healthcare system Every, every you know couple of years, decade or so, we can't do that in the U.S. What we can do, though, is to work together to create the right incentives so that providers and those who are on the 
supply side of healthcare have every incentive to be clear about what it is they're providing and what it is that they're charging for those services on the one hand. And on the demand side for consumers, that there is every effort and ability to get access to information that people need to make smart decisions and to have access to tools. By the way, some of those tools will be developed by the private sector, by entrepreneurs and by visionaries who can help people make right the right decisions. I think that is the way that we do this. The way that we do this is taking the system we have and beginning to bend it toward a system where there is more transparency, where there is a better ability for people to make choices that are smart and thoughtful choices. By the way, some of this is already happening. Um, increasingly, employers have encouraged employees to sign up for uh, accounts that provide truly catastrophic coverage, coupled with health savings accounts or other vehicles that allow people to save for their own health care in a tax-free way. And those plans are not for everybody, but for many people in the working primes of their lives, they, they're actually very good solutions because they enable people to use health insurance like insurance. I often say the challenge we have with health insurance in America is it's more like prepaid health care. It's not really insurance. If you think about homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, the reason you have it is not to cover like a broken window or to get gas. You, you have those things in case something happens catastrophic to your vehicle or to your home. And health insurance really doesn't function in the same way. And so the more that we can move health insurance in the direction of being insurance. And again, we want to be mindful that for some, they're not going to be in a financial position to save for their health care. They're not going to be in a financial position to be able to make these kinds of decisions. And so we have a safety net for that. But I'm talking about for the broad majority of working Americans who are able to afford the, the coverage they have, can we begin to shift that coverage in a direction that enables people to be covered in a way that looks more like health insurance and to do it transparently? I think that is the direction we want to shift it in. But I don't believe that completely starting over is going to be right. I think that's, I think, I, I just don't see how we do that in, 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 in this day and age. Yeah. Got it. Yep. It's, uh, we, we could probably talk about healthcare for, for 10 hours. Cause it's, it's such a beast, but I will, uh, I, will <laughs> I, I will leave you with a, uh, an opportunity here for a closing statement for any, any of the listeners in the golden state. Well, I, I just hope people will, uh, take the time to look seriously at this race next year, at this election next year. We don't typically spend a lot of time on some of these down ticket offices like controller. I think it's very important that people understand we have an opportunity in California to take what is great and make it even greater, to fix some of the challenges that we that we face, but more importantly, to send an important message to the insiders and to those who um, you know have essentially allowed the system to work for them for these many years, that it's time for the system to work for people who actually pay taxes and contribute every day to make California better. And the only way we do that is through this elections process. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I consider myself a vote for change, a vote for competency, and frankly, for a little bit of decency in government too. You know, I'm not approaching this from an ideological perspective. Um, you know, I don't see this as a opportunity to advance cultural or social concerns. I see this as an opportunity to say, how can we make the state of California work better? And I believe that we can do that. Uh, and, and my candidacy is, is part of that. So if people are interested, I do encourage them to go to my website, chenforcalifornia.com, C-H-E-N-F-O-R, california.com, to check out more about me and my candidacy and what I'm trying to do. And I hope to earn your support. And uh, we'll be out there talking to people about what I'm trying to do here over the next several months before our primary election next June. Awesome. We will uh, <clears throat> we will link to everything in the show notes. And uh, it was it was great to have you on. Thanks, Lonnie. Good luck in the race. Hey, thanks, Jeff. All Thank right. you.